What's up, future respiratory therapist? This episode is a special episode. I'm joined today by a very special guest, JJ the RT. Absolutely. We're going to go through Coach's RT talk with the standard here. And when we talk about the standard, we've got to talk about this group of people. This group is the inaugural group of the APRT at o the Ohio State. You can't talk about the standard without talking about this group. They have done things that that are just blazing a trail for us and, and our future with this profession. So uh, we were lucky enough to talk to them and I hope you enjoy this. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Get ready, next episode, RT Talk with the Standard. So I, I just wanna take this opportunity here real quick to welcome everybody to this amazing opportunity to interview the very first class of the advanced practice respiratory therapist a degree out of the Ohio <laughs> State University. And so um, we're going to ask them some questions. We're going to see, uh, learn a little bit about their journey today. We're going to figure out where they see this journey going. And we hope you learn from it. And we also hope maybe you might be inspired to maybe follow in their footsteps. Uh, these are the people that were brave enough to take the first step. And so without any further ado, uh, my name is Joe Lewis. Uh, we know we have JJ the RT here with us. JJ, you want to introduce yourself? Hey everybody, JJ the RT here. Um, I don't know, not really big on the, on the uh, YouTube scene yet, but uh, kind of making some pushes on Instagram. Go check it out. Um, but I'm currently a traveling respiratory therapist in the Virgin Islands. Last night was actually my last night for about 30 days, but I'm coming back. So I'm on holiday. So yeah. I'll be looking to probably do some more things like this and just spend some time with more people in the community over the next 30 days. Or so. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, JJ, for being here. If you don't know, JJ is kind of the, the co-host of this interview, if that's what you want to call it. Um, he, you're going to see this posted on his YouTube channel on his version of The Standard. Um, it'll be on my version of RT Talk. And now we're going to get to the most important part of all of this, which is giving recognition to the people who actually earned the degree. So we're going to start here uh, by giving them just a few minutes to tell a little bit about themselves. Uh, whatever they want to say, it's your time. Okay, so we're going to start here with Mindy Conklin. Hi, Mindy Conklin. Uh, I've been a respiratory therapist for 11 years at The Ohio State University. Um, I'm a mom of three. I went through this program working Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. Um, and I did it successfully and it's been a fantastic experience. Perfect. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, next we have Courtney Thompson. Hey guys, um, I'm Courtney Thompson. Um, I have been a respiratory therapist for six years now at The Ohio State. Um, I actually graduated from Marshall University in West Virginia before I came up here. Um, I went through the program all on night shift. Um, working all kinds of schedules, so I was a little bit of everywhere, um, and yeah, that's me. Perfect. I love it. Um, Poonam Shingala, tell yeah, us a little bit um, about yourself. Hi, I'm Poonam Shingala. I'm, um, I've been an RT here at Nationwide Children's Hospital for nine years. Um, I did my undergrad at Ohio State, um, and I do have two little kids. I have two toddlers, um, kind of while I was going through this program as well. Um, and then I also, like Mindy, worked every weekend for the last two and a half years to get this done. And yes, we, we can live to tell about it because we all made it through the program uh, successfully. Yeah. Perfect. I love that. You can live to tell about it. That is such a great statement right there. Uh, and then finally, we have Scott Hazelwood. Hey everyone, Scott Hazelwood. I am an RT for over the past seven years. I've been working at The Ohio State University, previously worked at Cleveland Clinic main campus. I did my undergrad at Bowling Green State University and uh, just like Courtney, primarily did my work during night shift and proud to say that we all made it through and ready to make an impact. Nice. All right, I love it. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna kick it off to JJ because I think he says it best uh, when we were talking the other day. So JJ, I'm gonna let you kick off the question aspect of this. What do you have to either say or to ask any of these, any of these uh, graduates? 
Absolutely. Again, thank you guys for joining us. Um, we are truly honored to have you because this is a program that I've been hearing about for quite some time. And actually, it was on my radar to go to go into the APRT program at one point. But, um, you know, my my kind of path led me more towards education now. So I've kind of shifted that from uh, wanting to be kind of that main person at the bedside to now shifting over to education and molding the future. But what, what I really wanted to say is, is you guys are absolutely the pioneers for this program. And it is truly exciting. I am, I am definitely um, um, excited and proud to say that I'm getting to be a part of this group right now. Uh, at least from an outside perspective, and I get to pick your brains a little bit. So um, whoever really wants to take this question first is, is more than welcome to. But um, when you got into this program, did you realize that you were going to be making history? <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Like, <laughs> that's such a loaded question. Like, um, I, it's a great like it's true it is, though you no, guys are you guys are changing the mold for tank jockey to oh. neb jockey to now yeah, Come on, practicing you can't see my hand yeah yeah absolutely um i i i'll let the others speak too but i feel like it still hasn't quite hit us <laughs> even though we've graduated and we do things like this it's just crazy to think that we're the only seven with this type of degree ever um, in the United States. And it's, um, especially when we have to like tell other healthcare professionals kind of what we went to school for and we get to explain to them what that is. It's just, it's great every time we have to do it. So it's wonderful. Mindy, what do you say? Um, our, our professors told us that we would be making history, but I don't think it really set into us that we would literally be like the pioneers of this um, program to like grow our profession to a, a new level. So it's been very exciting. Um, like I told you before, um, just being able to care for like the whole entire patient and not just be the net person or the person on the ventilator. Um, it's been, it's been a really true honor. Cool. Scott, you got something here? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's fine. Um, I think for, I can, I don't know, at Children's, I feel like the vibe is pretty electric. It's exciting. We've um, talked a lot about it on social media, and um, you guys are helping, obviously, get the word out there. Um, but it's really, it's really humbling to hear high praise from other people, like um, our different departments throughout the hospital, attendings, other nurses, other RTs that are curious, even some of the undergrad students that are asking us questions about it, where they're not even finished with their own um, you know, uh, their own bachelors yet. So it's been exciting to see just how excited everyone else is. Um, and that vibe is really encouraging. It's, um, it's been um, pretty neat. It's been, it's, it's kind of hard to put into words that we're, and to think like we're the first in the country and actually we are, we are the first in the country. Um, but it's also nice to see how excited everyone else is around us. So. I, I, I may be wrong about this, but I don't think you're the first in the country. I think you are the first in the world, right? Yes. I mean, let's be real here. Like, let's not like, try to minimize it and be like, oh, we're the first in Ohio, or we're the first <laughs> in the country. <laughs> Seven are the first in the world. You do know Marinate what they that. call us, right? <laughs> do what? I said, you do know what they call us. They call us the Magnificent Seven. The Magnificent Seven. Oh, I love that. Magnificent. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put Magnificent out here next to this. Yeah. You guys, you guys need to have like your own Instagram page. Instead yeah. Of the Magnificent Seven. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. I was, like that needs to be a whole thing. Like hashtag all of it. We'll get it trending. Yeah. If we'll anybody can, this trending. guy right here can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Scott, what you want to add to this conversation? Yeah, you know, I don't think it's really fully set in yet. And, you know, I think a word that we're going to throw around quite a bit and continue to for quite a while is that, you know, we're trailblazers. You know, we're setting that path for others to follow us. And, you know, it's, it's a big, big deal. And, 
I know the seven of us are really proud and honored to, you know, to pave the way. <clears throat> I think that I think that's awesome. I think you are going to hear that word a lot. And I think that's uh, an amazing thing. Let me ask you this question. Okay. And Scott, I'm going to leave it on you because I don't want you to have to go last every time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with you this time and we'll work backwards the way we came to you. Okay, Scott. So my question is this, think back to before you started this program. Okay. Would you have considered yourself a trailblazer at the RRT level? You know, to be honest with you, I don't think I would. Um, you know, just one of the many, um, you know, little fish in a big pond. And, you know, definitely didn't think of myself as that. What, why not? Well, because I guess nothing truly drastically would set us apart from anyone else. Okay, fair enough. Good answer. I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Poonam, what do you think? Yeah, so I agree with Scott. Um, although we are all seasoned um, respiratory therapists, we have a ton of experience under our belt. Ha just being an RRT, um, I wouldn't consider myself a tra trailblazer or a leader in any capacity. Um, however, Scott and I have talked about this a little bit. Is we would I think one of the reasons we even considered doing this program is um, to kind of get some of that autonomy, kind of be able to be leaders um, in what kind of drove us really into this, um, is kind of having some independence to make some of those decisions for our patients, but, um, and kind of having a, a more impactful say in their care. So. Okay, perfect. Courtney? Um, I might feel just a little differently than the others. Um, which that was a great question. Um, I came from a very small area in West Virginia. So even just to move to Columbus, Ohio for me was huge. And I felt like I already was kind of like living out the dreams of um, other people just be able to move and be a part of such a large hospital. Because I remember when I posted on Facebook when I got this job six years ago, people were like, oh, that's great to move to such a bigger area and work at such a bigger hospital. And they're so great at that. So I kind of felt like that from that, but it did kind of, I don't say die off, but you get kind of used to it after six years, but I never thought that it would be to this extent of actually trailblazing in the respiratory profession. So it's been wonderful. Yeah. Morgantown? Uh, no, technically Huntington. Okay. Marshall. So WVU is an all friends. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. All right. Uh, Mindy, what, 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 what say you? I kind of feel the same way Courtney does. Um, I probably the oddball of the group. I didn't go to college until I was 31. So I was a stay at home mom, decided, hey, my kids are in school. Um, I want to go to college. And I knew when I did my clinical rotation, I wanted to work at Ohio State. Um, and I think that for me, I feel like um, a trailblazer because we do a lot of clinicals for the undergrad students and they look up to you. So I feel like you have to put yourself um, at a higher standard in order to teach these young respiratory therapy students um, the proper ways to care for a patient and assess a patient and the critical thinking skills. So I think that um, in the end, I feel like I am a trailblazer in the respiratory therapy world. Nice. So I just want to throw this out real quick and I'm going to toss it back to JJ. Um, you just said something that really hits deep inside of me. Uh, I, I've been teaching at the associate's degree level now for, for 10 years. And there's a lot of talk about moving to the bachelor entry requirement. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, I, uh, it's not, that's not the point of this conversation. I, I, I'm in favor of it, okay? I'm not against it. I think if it helps the profession, then it's a good thing, okay? But I will tell you that I believe that if we go to a bachelor entry degree level program, I think we'll miss out on the Mindy's. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody at 31, 32, 33 is looking to go back to school for a four-year bachelor's degree. Not, not none of them. So don't, mm -hmm. don't take me to task on that. But I'm just saying in general, the associates, <laughs> did you start at the associate's degree level or no? Uh, yes, I did. I started, got my associates in respiratory therapy and then went on to get a bachelor's in healthcare management. And so I feel like I got the same education as somebody else who got their RRT. Right. 
So my point is, is that it's, it's not, it's not rocket science to mm -hmm. know that you were probably about to tell me that um, right. because at that non-traditional level, you find people coming back to what can I get into from a mm -hmm. career mode at the cheapest, fastest rate. And at a two year degree for $10,000 less, give or take a little bit, depending on where you're going, it just makes sense. And I'm afraid, mm -hmm. I'm so afraid that, that we're going to miss out on the Mindy. So I just want to say thank you, Mindy. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of you for where you started from going back as a non-traditional student. And here you are now a part of this group. I think it's an amazing story. JJ. Thank you. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like we're doing a fantasy football draft going up <laughs> yeah, and yeah. back down and then we'll come back around. We're just prepping for a couple months from now. That's all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to switch gears just a little bit um, and, and maybe a little bit more superficial conversation, just kind of take the air, uh, take the heaviness away from from the to, from the room and the, the conversation. But where where do you guys plan on working? Adult, peds, clinic? Uh, ICU. What, what's your plan there? Mindy? Um, I really enjoy my outpatient experience. Um, I'm not against working in the ICU at all. Um, I'm really curious and very interested in pulmonary hypertension. Um, and I do know that there's could be a couple opportunities for us there. And um, I kind of found outpatient sleep to be one of my favorite rotations. So I can see myself going outpatient. Nice. Yeah. Courtney? Um, I also really liked my outpatient rotation. I went into clinicals when we started 100% um, into inpatient and knew exactly that's what I wanted to do. And then I <laughs> clinicals in the outpatient world. I was like, whoa, what have I been missing for the past? Mm -hmm. um, so I think definitely outpatient could be the place for me. Um, sleep medicine was definitely kind of to mimic Mindy, a great rotation. Um, but I'm also not against um, working in the IC or inpatient as well. So it'll be kind of interesting to see what I decide to choose, but um, could go either way, honestly. Unam? Yeah. Um, so similar. Uh, I think I'm the only one on here that works at Children's. Um, and I, no offense with adults, love them, but. Um, I work a lot harder for the kids. So um, I will continue to stay at Children's. Um, it is my home. Um, and I think for me, I have a hard time kind of narrowing down where I want to be at. Um, I really enjoyed um, pulmonary outpatient sleep as well. Um, but I liked kind of the both together. Um, as well as if I had to work inpatient, I'd like to be inpatient palm. Um, it just uh, resonated. I like the atmosphere. I like the mm -hmm. patient uh, profiles. And um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see right now. Um, things are still in conversations, early conversations right now. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. I wish I would have known you guys were so interested in sleep. Monday, <laughs> I put on a sleep workshop for the Texas Society of Respiratory Care. And it would have been amazing to have you guys on. I've been planning this thinking thing for, well, a, a committee and I have been planning this thing since the beginning of the year. And if I would have known that you guys were so interested, that would have been so much easier. Oh, we got at least three speakers here. We're done with half of it, but that's awesome. Thank, I was thinking uh, Scott. the same thing, JJ. Yeah. What do, you, what do you say, Scott? So I would like to be in the adult patient population and uh, what really I enjoyed the most was pulmonary consults in the inpatient setting. And, you know, if I could maybe do that with a combination of pulmonary outpatient clinic or maybe a combination within the medical ICU, I think that would be a great fit. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, thank I not to, to put myself in there, but if I were to go into the program, I probably would find myself in an ICU. I, I just like that setting. I, I could have used you last night, Poonam. I went to my first C-section ever. Um, those little critters, they're not for me, but I, I like my adults. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Poonam a question here real quick because I'm really, I really want to know. Uh, why do you work harder for pediatrics than you do adults? Because they don't have a history. 
right? They haven't done anything yet. They haven't smoked any cigarettes. They haven't destroyed their livers yet, you know, um, with alcohol and things like that. So for me, um, I kind of see it as they're brand new. Um, and I want to give them the best shot I can um, in terms of whatever I could do for to help them breathe, right? Um, and we do that every day here. Um, and so, I don't know, plus they're really cute. <laughs> so let me ask you, you're in a hot seat right now, just FYI. So um, you think pediatrics are more deserving of better quality care than adults? No, no, not by any means. Um, That's what no. you just said. Um, I just, I, what I mean to say is they haven't, they don't have a history. They haven't, um, you know. They just, also haven't contributed to society. <laughs> 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 but they were just born five minutes ago, right? So okay. we just, All we right. want to make them upstanding okay. members of society uh, by giving them a chance to breathe. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Poonam, you're, you're on the hot seat because that's a hot button for Joe. That's a hot button, man. Anytime, like, I'm sorry, like, like, I mean, I'll, I'll work hard for anybody, but but my uh, my love is in the adult world, and and it dri it drives me crazy. It really does, and this is not anything to you. I'm not talking to you right now, Puna. I'm really talking to everybody who might be watching. It drives me crazy when I see the quality of care in the pediatric world and the neonatal world is so up here, and then the adult world is so down here. Well, why, why do you have so many staff members? Why are you the biggest hospital in the area because you're a children's hospital? Oh, because we don't do, we do one-on-one -on -one care. Well, does that... That does, that's not even an argument. Did you really just say that as a manager? That doesn't even make sense. Anyways, Scott, I got a question for you. Um, this is not about me. This is about y'all. So let's get back to y'all. Scott, um, here's, here's the question I have uh, for all of you, but we're going to start back here with Scott. So I'm curious to know how you see this platform. Um, do you see it as a platform to move out and continue to promote and advocate for like, where do you see the RRR, the RRTs as in your role? Like, are you going to be an advocate for them? Or is this like a, a, a move into an advanced practice degree and now I'm in this role and I've suddenly forgotten about where I came from? What do you think about that? Well, we're certainly going to be an advocate for an RRT. You know, we were there. We, you know are still there but at a higher level but not only are we going to advocate for those bedside respiratory therapists but you know we're going to advocate for those bedside nurses we're going to advocate for those bedside residents who may not be fully aware of how a ventilator works how a certain mode may work and why you know we're doing what we're doing and you know we are a head to toe profession. And, you know, so we're advocating for anyone who is going to care for that patient from a head to toe standpoint. Nice. Was there talk in your program as you went through it? Was there talk like, like, let's say like you're in the ICU and you're trying to manage mechanical ventilation. Is there, like, I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for how this relationship is going to work between you as an APRT and me as an RRT, like, 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 how's it gonna look? What's it gonna, what, are we gonna be standing at the ventilator together or am I gonna be calling you going, hey, come look at the patient? Like, what, what is this gonna look like? Um, I feel like it's a communication. So if we were in rounds, I would wanna be with my respiratory therapist and go over, um, you know, what is the plateau pressure? What is, you know, what can we do to wean the patient from the ventilator today? I just don't want to delegate to them. I want to them to be involved with the care also. Yeah, cool. I think I so that. too, that it's about almost um, creating a support system because mm -hmm. you work at such a big medical center. I feel like sometimes respiratory is not heard. Um, so I feel like this is our chance to get this advanced practice up into that role to really speak for the respiratory side of things because so many people assume that, oh, this is what they do in respiratory therapy. And then it's actually the complete opposite. Like they're making decisions because they think they know what we do or how 
we work. And I think another big area for us as well um, is to help create protocols or guidelines um, or kind of those things to work with RT to do that. There's no reason why we can't have a lot more protocols and stuff for the RT to operate at the bedside like nursing or anyone else either. So I think that is going to be a huge relationship too. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to vary between inpatient and outpatient. Inpatient, um, I can see all the things we've talked about happening. Outpatient, outside of our PFT lab, we really don't have any RTs outpatient. Like in the sleep, outside of sleep, in an actual sleep clinic, um, there's not any respiratory therapists there kind of like helping with the patients and that kind of thing. And that would be a perfect place for people. Um, so I think definitely advocating for that too would be huge. Nice. Yeah, I think um, while the RT, we are um, still our RTs, and I think we're, we all chose to become APRTs because we didn't want to get into, get away from our profession, right, and our industry of wanting to get, jump ship and go do nursing um, or go do, um, uh, become a PA or things like that. So for us to continue to support the RTs, the bedside RTs especially, is, and while kind of working in a collaborative way um, and also educating. We all work for teaching hospitals. So a big role of what we do every day is teaching, right? Or precepting or orienting um, in some capacity. So we can orient and precept across the profession as well. So we sometimes will have a med student that we do a lecture with, or we do um, precepting of nurses and things like that. So already we're a collaborative group. Um, and so I think Continuing that, as well as, you know, yeah, I agree with Courtney, the, the setting would look different and your role would be different as an APRT, maybe outpatient, you're doing a little bit more um, uh, kind of direct ordering of things and um, protocols, treatments, therapies, things like that. Inpatient, it might be more rounds, again, more orders and things like that, but you're still communicating um, efficiently with the bedside team, right? That's the whole goal is to kind of tie some of these um, things together across the spectrum. Nice, nice, very good. Scott, you want to you want to follow up on this? Add up, to, add to it. No, I th I think what everyone said was pretty on point. Um, okay. and Puna makes a great statement about you know collaboration between yeah. between everyone. Yeah, for for sure, collaboration is. Um, something that me and JJ talk a lot about, man, we can, you can probably see him smile here in just a second, not because I cued him to smile, but because he knows that we over the past several, several months have talked more about collaboration and the need for it. Um, we're never going to get to where we want to go if we don't join arms with PT, OT, speech, nursing, dietitians, pharmacy. I mean, it's just all about collaboration. It doesn't feel like we're there yet, but it feels like we might be getting closer to getting there. JJ, you're up, man. Yeah, um, another kind of fun topic that, that I, I kind of am interested in is, I know you guys are gonna be able to do procedures and, and diagnostic things. Um, which one was the most difficult for you to, to, to learn and which one was the most fun? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the most fun one that pops to my head is um, learning how to bronc. <laughs> it's a lot of fun because I think as a bedside RT, especially in the ICU for the past six years, I've assisted with so many, like I've lost count, but to actually be able to be the one that drives and does things like that. We um, did interventional pulmonology clinicals as well. So we were able to do like the EBUS. Um, stents, like that kind of thing. So that was super cool to learn. Um, and every time we got to do it, it was great. I don't know about the hardest one. I, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I think still to, um, probably, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's the hardest one. I think I enjoyed like all of them just being to like step up and do like just such an array of procedures that it was fantastic. I think the one that still probably makes me uncomfortable, we'll use that one a little bit is maybe like a chest tube type thing because it's I don't, in my head it's so that's such a big thing um but that's probably bronx or my favorite 
JJ, I think you stumped her. I think you gave her the one quiz question she couldn't answer. Hey, I'm not. That's not what I'm here for. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm just here to get some smiles, and I, apparently that worked. Yeah. Mindy, what about you? Did you say Mindy? Yeah. Oh, um, I agree with Courtney. Bronx is really awesome to do. Um, I got to do a lot of Bronx during a trach. And you know, we're usually the one holding the ET tube so we don't lose the tube. Um, so it was really cool to go down and be the one in control of letting the resident or the attending or fellow um, be able to treat that patient. Um, so I thought that was the fun part of it. Um, for me, central lines wasn't, they was more made me nervous than anything because you had to hold the ultrasound and you had to push them with the needle the same time you pull back. So coordinating, you know, your ultrasound and your, um, your needle for insertion was a little nerve wracking. I wouldn't call it scary. It was more like, please don't give this patient a pneumo. Um, but that's what I enjoyed. So. Now you're speaking my language. Um, yes. Yeah. Just a little background on me. Um, I was part of a group in Texas who started doing central lines. Um, and that was almost a week of hell learning how to do central lines. But mm -hmm. once you kind of got those first handful dozen mm -hmm. under your belt, it, it's a whole different world. And, mm -hmm. and it's such a fun tool. And ultrasound, we'll get into ultrasound next. But mm -hmm. Poonam, what do you say about, about the most fun and most difficult or challenging? Um, most fun. Uh, I, th I think I had the most fun in two different settings. Um, yes, the Bronx were super fun. Um, but I really like getting the critical ENT, kind of the anesthesia airways in the OR. Um, because there's nothing more difficult than some of these airways and I was able to get them. So that was a lot of fun. It was, um, it was really rewarding to see do that. Um, the still the thing that still makes me so nervous um, and uncomfortable is definitely the central lines. Um, I can talk you through it, but I still get a little nervous trying to do that. So start playing video games, you'll get better at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel there's like a study that. link that links the two. It's really crazy. But yeah, Scott, what you got, my friend? Yeah, so I think the uh, the best was probably a bedside thoracentesis. Uh, it was uh, uh, ultrasound guided and, you know, able to pull off all that fluid while the patient was sitting upright and awake. And, you know, just seeing all that fluid being aspirated out into a larger bag and close to like three liters was, you know, pretty satisfying and, and um, you know, a great rush to be able to do that after seeing so many. And then, you know, just kind of echo what Mindy and Puma already said, yeah, central lines are just a whole different, whole different thing. And, you know, when, when you're done, it's, you know, you're not done from there. Then it's, you know, getting some sort of imaging done to make sure you're at where you need to be and uh, you know, checking for bleeding from the site. And you know, there's just a lot more to it than you know, many may think. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that, was, that was kind of one of the, the fun things um, and, and kind of the feather in the hat moment, right? Is, is RTs being able to do central lines. I think we need to give our, our kudos to Banner Health out in Arizona. They're the ones that pioneered that. But um, I think there's 13 different states that have RTs doing vascular access now. Um, there's not a quote unquote scope of practice that says it's out of our scope. Um, so definitely that is something that I'm a big proponent of is advocating for that vascular access. Um, Joe, you got something? I'm going to follow up with ultrasound after you, yeah. after yours. Well, I've got, I've got one more question and I got one more thought, but I'm going to ask the question first. Scott, I'll start with you because that seems to be the trend here. Um, my question is, is when I watched the RT to PA's interview with Courtney, uh, Courtney, you made a statement that was something revolving around this. I'm not going to quote you exactly because I, I would probably mess it up and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you essentially said that you were looking to build the trust to let you and your cohort to find the data to show what your value is, okay? So my question to each of you is, 
what is your number one goal when you talk about finding data to prove value for RT? What is it for you? Scott. Wow, uh, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, I think just as a whole, I think if we're able to show some sort of a percent of maybe if we're intervening and you know able to do some sort of procedure maybe a little quicker than normally that you know if we can decrease any sort of mortality rate within the hospital setting i think just you know increasing life is just our main goal as a healthcare profession as as a whole i agree with that 100% and we'll clap and we'll yeah but what but I think the question is, is do you have anything specific that you like are interested in in studying to show data on? Nothing specific. Uh, you know, that, that'd be something that I'd have to think about. I think okay. I'll pass that along to my cohorts. Okay. All right. Say. Poonam, what do you think about? Um I I wanna say, um, yeah, I kind of want to piggyback a little bit on um, Scott. Also, yeah, we're trying to improve mortality. However, at the same time, one of the things that we've learned during our program is the business side of medicine, right? So also, how does that impact your patient? Um, how does the hospital um, stay afloat? Um, one of the challenging parts of our program was going through and learning all of this stuff while we we're in the middle of a global pandemic, seeing how all of that was also um, taking its toll on the hospitals um, and things like that. But one of the things that I want to, uh, my master's project was on um, pediatric um, sleep. Um, and so it was like telemedicine and CPAP adherence with pediatric and adult patients. So for me, I want to personally take that on um, and kind of keep going with that research to say, okay, like if I was a champion of non-invasive mechanical ventilation, which there's no one that knows it better than we do, right? We just know that as a profession, sure. no one knows it better than we do and no one can explain it as well as us. So um, if I were to take that on, how would that impact an outpatient practice. How would that impact access for my patients? Um, could they get a hold of me quicker? Do they always need a physician provider? Um, how, how, does, how does all that look? Um, and so some of that stuff I talked about in my master's thesis, but um, I kind of want to put it into practice as well and see just the, nice. how does that work together. Mm -hmm. I, got, I, have a, I have a really good contact over in Pennsylvania. He's, a, he's, he's actually, like, I don't know, like, can you, you probably can because you probably got greater contacts than I have. I only have one contact that is involved in telehealth. Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in that contact, send me a message, I'll get you hooked up with them. Maybe able to help you with that project. Courtney, what do you say? Um, I think, especially in that interview, what I was talking about, um, Mainly is, so I currently in my RT role, I'm actually the um, team lead for, um, so I'm like 60% clinical and then 40% doing a lot of education and stuff. Um, so I work already a lot with extubation time. So seeing how quick, like once the patient passes their SBT, how quickly they can be extubated. Um, and it's not as quick as what we thought it was going to be. So I think that is a huge place for APRTs to make that decision because um, we can reintubate them if they fail um, and we're kind of like the fail safe for that so it would be a nice spot and then I think also too um, really I, I hate to keep saying NIMV or CPAP BiPAP but sometimes it gets so confusing especially with residents um, and then certain fellows as well like they just don't understand the overall picture or how to truly manage it or manage it they may know what CPAP is what BiPAP is but they don't know IPAP, EPAP, they don't know what the C flex is. They don't know all of those things that go along with it to help better manage that patient. And they're quicker to jump to other therapies or more invasive therapies because they don't know how to manage that. Um, so I think it would be cool to see once we start practicing 
um, kind of how that affects the management of certain respiratory things. I love that conversation right there. I mean, that, that, JJ, we were talking about this last night. It was like, I asked JJ last night, I was like, why do residents choose vent modes based off of what team they're on? If you're on surgery, you're going SINV. If you're on medicine, you're going AC. Mm -hmm. And if you try to do something outside of that box, oh, you're done, mm -hmm. right? It's so important. That's such a true, I like that. I, I, I like that in, in, in you guys having a hand-to-hand a -hand role because, I mean, let's be honest, they will respect you more because you are seen at a higher level than, than the, the bedside RRT, which is not a diminishment to any bedside RRT. But the truth is, is that your practice and your degree is seen as a higher level. So maybe there are waves to be made in that right there. I would love for all of you to connect with your closest university to teach the med students that that's stupid. Anyways, Mindy, go ahead. Um, so for my capstone project, I was looking into um, ultrasound. Um, and since we were in a global pandemic, uh, I chose to study the um, how we can use ultrasound in the outpatient setting to monitor the residual effects of COVID. Um, so I would like to look into more if we can monitor the patients who are in the ICU with a lung and cardiac ultrasound. And then, because we're gonna have like an outpatient clinic for COVID here eventually, um, and then send those patients to the outpatient clinic and be able to follow up like a six month to yearly follow up on their cardiopulmonary status from COVID to see if there's any changes in their <clears throat> their heart or their cardiac function um, so we can treat them. Cool. I think that's phenomenal. And I know JJ is going to jump all over that in just a mm -hmm. second. I want to give Scott, because I think I might have shortchanged Scott on that question, kind of blindsided him with it. Mm -hmm. If while everybody else was talking, have you thought of anything else you wanted to say on this or are you good? Uh, I'm, I guess to uh, continue, you know, focusing on, you know, our capstone thesis projects, you know, what I did it on was the use of ketamine as an induction agent versus other, you know, induction agents and whether or not that can be used more primarily as opposed to the typical induction medication like a Tomidate. And I think just, you know, kind of looking at that data and, you know, if there's any support to show, again, going back to decreasing patient mortality or co comorbidities, you know, is just, you know, something that I would like to continue to focus on. Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's, I'm, I'm with you on that. So, um, JJ, take away your ultrasound stuff. I know you're about to go there. Absolutely. So, so I'm like, like itching to, to, <laughs> to talk about ultrasound because, um, and my experience with ultrasound started with the central line stuff, right? The, the practice of, of the RTs placed in central lines. And then it expanded to, you know, post line insertion to doing a pneumo screen, right? With the ultrasound. Um, now it's expanded into doing a whole full chest examination, cardiac exam, and and going through the blue protocol and, and, and things of that nature. And some of the conversations that I've had with, with Joe is at some point, I feel the ultrasound is going to replace the stethoscope. What say you? Anybody? Coin flip, ready to go. I don't know if it'll necessarily replace the stethoscope in certain situations. But I can see how um, Boot taking out. ultrasounds. Boot her out. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm well, there's, kidding. Ahead, I mean, in, in certain settings, I can see that that could replace a stethoscope. But like if you're just doing like med surge patients, I don't see that necessarily the need for it. <clears throat> but like the outpatient world or um, bedside assessment in the ICU, if you want to see if they're fluid overloaded, you don't need to listen. You can just look to see if there's consolidation or fluid in there. Um, and then also with pneumonia, you could see those areas of consolidation on an ultrasound. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I could in certain situations see ultrasound taking a 
prefer the stethoscope for sure, um, especially with cardiac and pulmonary, especially. Just because there's so many things you're like, well, like, do I hear breath sounds? Do I not? Is that there? Like, how do we double check? And guess what? Ultrasound that we can just roll right up to the bedside can tell us most of the time yes or no. And if not, then it leads us to go another way to figure out the answer to our question that sometimes just a stethoscope can't. But I do think it's important that we don't lose the stethoscope skill in a way to know how to like quickly assess if there's not an ultrasound readily available. Bye, Kunam. Thank you for being here. She had to go. So she, she ran away from the question. She had to run. She didn't want to answer the question. You got her, JJ. <laughs> Scott, go ahead, man. I think it can be a mixture of both. Uh, you know, with the evolving use of technology, you know, we can plug in a ultrasound probe adapter into our phones and, you know, check out, um, you know, what the patient has going on just that quick and easy. Um, but at the same time, you know, if we are extubating a patient and, you know, there's concern of any sort of upper airway strider or edema, you know, that readily available and go-to stethoscope is, you know, it's hard to match. But I definitely think that there is you know, there could be a use for both in, in our, in our world. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I, I actually have one of those that I can throw into my pocket and I'd take it to the bedside um, and used it for a patient that had uh, uh, pleural effusion last night and assessed them for fluid overload myself. Um, so when you were talking about that thoracentesis and then assessing, you know, fluid overload and things like that, I was like, oh yeah, I got to put that into practice last night. So it's just really cool to see the technologies that are available and, and the progression of where the profession is going. Uh, it just truly, truly excites me and keeps me engaged. Um, but I think uh, <laughs> I've been kind of pe peppering you guys with the jabs. I'll let Joe come with another heavy hook and see what, what other questions or thoughts he has. Well, I don't, I, I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to recap everything that's kind of been said, if you'll in, engage with me for just a second. Um, <clears throat> these are the areas of interest that y'all have talked about. I think these are all great areas, talking about the use of ketamine, um, ultrasound, extubation times, um, and how does that, how can we get, how can we reduce those? How can we get them quicker? How can we get people off the ventilator quicker? I love that pediatric and sleep along with telemedicine. And look, if you're not on the telemedicine train, then you're stuck at the station because it's coming. It's, it's already here, but it's coming and it's going to be a big deal. Um, I love the ideas of, you know, getting involved with procedures and decreasing mortality and you, and, and, and you seven, uh, we're not just talking to the three that are left with us right now, but the seven of you who graduated of seeing a role in that. I love the fact that this right here came up in this conversation. Like you're actually going to talk about decreased mortality because you see you have a role in that. And I love that concept. If you know anything about me, you know, I'm a big patient advocate. I'm all about what's best for the patient, whether it's peds, even though she's gone or adults, <laughs> it's still, they're all, it's all a human life. And I love all things that reduce mortality and reduce morbidity and get patients out of the hospital quicker. I love that. Um, the bronchoscopy was seen to be the most exciting theme or the funnest to learn from you. So I, 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 I envy you in this because I would probably agree that that's super exciting to get to run that piece of equipment. Um, the thoracentesis was another exciting moment, but then the flip side of that was the central lines being super scary. So that kind of puts that into perspective. I love this statement right here when we talked about advocating for respiratory therapy going forward. And uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, but I think Courtney said RTs are not heard. And I think that's so true. I think we have ownership to take in that. In that. I think we've messed up for many, many years and leading to us not being heard. 
but hopefully U7 can somehow begin the process along with what a lot of other people are doing well out there to get RT's voices up and heard so that we do, people realize that we do have an impact to make because I think that's valuable. Continue to advocate for the profession. The autonomy seems to be kind of the underlying theme of what led you into this, looking for more autonomy. You wanted, you wanted that level of being able to make decisions. I think that's a beautiful thing. I don't think there's any respiratory therapists out there. As a matter of fact, if you ask me, when it comes to, 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 to job satisfaction, I think it comes down to two things, control of schedule and autonomy. That's what I think the two biggest things are. I don't even think pay has anything to do with it. I think it's scheduling and autonomy. So I agree with this 100%. Um, a lot of these words came here early. Pioneers, the Magnificent Seven, you guys are trailblazers. Like, you know, it's going to set you apart from everybody else. And, and you're, you should be proud of yourselves because you've done something that no one else has ever done. And I don't care how big or small anybody thinks that is, the truth is, is the first person to do anything should be rewarded and, and should be applauded. And I applaud y'all here today. So Magnificent Seven, we're so happy you're here. My last question for you is when I say at the end of every one of my videos, average is easy. What would you say to respiratory therapists with that in mind right now? Um, I think it goes back to not being heard. Like it's easy just to sit back and not fight or not put your stuff out there and just clock in, clock out, do your job. Um, but average is easy and who wants to be average? I don't want to be average. I want to be a trailblazer. So nice. Mindy? I say the same thing Courtney is. Um, who wants to sit there and just listen and not speak up and have their voices heard? Um, we're here to advocate for the patient and for our professions. So, you know, let's trailblaze down the road. Yeah. Scott? Yeah. You know, done being average, done with things being easy. Let's keep things going. Let's push things to be harder. You know, we're more than just button pushers. We're more than just throwing nubs at people. You know, we're way more than that. And you know, we're going to start things and show everyone that we are. Yeah, I love, I love, I love that. Every single word y'all just said, I absolutely love. My mic is hooked up to a podium here, but if I could drop it right now, I probably would on the end of Scott's <laughs> word, words. Um, we're done with Nevs. We're done, not, not done with Nevs, but done with being viewed as that's what we are. Yeah. Oh, you're a respiratory therapist. You give nebulizers. Not, uh, I mean, that's, 15% maybe <laughs> of what it is, right? But there's a lot more to it. And so I think we've got a long ways to go, but I'm so thankful for you seven, um, for being, for doing what you did. And I hope that this can, can spring into where we can become regular contacts so that, 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 that I can help you however that looks and you can help me however that looks. Um, because the students that I'm teaching now need to know that this is an opportunity and they need to know that it's doable. I mean, can I just reiterate this for just a second? I'm sorry, JJ, I know you're ready to talk, but give me just a second here. I always talk too much, but that's okay. We have on this segment right now, um, we have Mindy, who is a mom of three and killed it. We have Courtney, who worked night shift throughout the program and killed it. We had Poonam on here, who is also a mother of two and worked night shift and killed it. And can we just say that like, whenever you think something feels impossible, like I can't do it, that's where you lost. That's where you lose <clears throat> is with somebody telling you it's not that simple. It is that simple. Just do it the way you seven just did it and i'm so proud of you and i'm gonna let jj wrap us up no well i mean you you hit the nail on the head right there when when you, you said it was just that simple right and some of the things that um we've been talking about recently is just be better 
right? Whatever that means for you. If that means being a better, you know, spouse, son, daughter, mother, whatever that is, just be better. If it's a respiratory therapist, clinician, nurse, whatever that is, just be better. And you cannot grow unless you get outside of that comfort zone, right? I'm sure for every one of you, you had to make a sacrifice and, and you get to smile now because you're reaping those rewards, right? And um, one of the, the like, most encouraging word for me in the English di dictionary is impossible. Because when you split that word apart, it says, I'm possible, right? And that's exactly what you guys did. You made it possible. You fought through every piece of, of adversity to get to this point and we are so proud of you and we just cannot celebrate you enough. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I failed to mention on the backside of that, that Scott as well worked night shift through the program. So Scott, I didn't want you to think that I was leaving you out. Um, JJ, if you don't have anything else, I'm going to leave it to, I'm going to, we're going to go Scott to Mindy to Courtney to take us away here. So any final thoughts that you have for any respiratory therapist, nurse, anybody who might be watching this, Scott, you got any final words? Well, I just want everyone to know that if you want to do this, you can do it. And, you know, let's spread the word. Let's everyone know what we're doing, what we want to do, what we can do. And, you know, let's just keep things going. Love it. Mindy, final thoughts? Uh, same thing. We need to spread the world across the United States to every state that um, we are needed. The population, um, the baby boomers are getting older. We need people who are specializing in cardiopulmonary to, to care for those patients. So, you know, we need to, to bring it up to a state level and be like, hey, we need this. We need APRTs. Nice. Courtney? Um, I think on the last note, I think people are so quick to tell us why this won't work <laughs> or why um, the downfalls of this. And I just cannot wait to show them wrong. And if anyone who's interested in being in a, is a respiratory therapist and wants to be an advanced practice provider, just don't let that stop you. Don't let other people's negative words or thoughts or, well, you didn't do good in this. So can you really do that? Like, just go do it. Just try it kind of back to your do it thing. I love that. Just go do it. You never know until you try. So just tell me I can't and I'll show you I can. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we, I, I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf. I think me and JJ here, we are so thankful that y'all joined us today. Like we've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I've, I've enjoyed just getting to know a little bit about each of you individually. Um, just hearing about your journey, hearing about your interests, hearing about how you relate and how you think about respiratory therapy. It's been a, a privilege and a, and, and a pleasure for me to listen to. Um, and I'll let JJ close it out. Well, I thought I closed it out already with the I'm possible, but you did. I mean, we'll, we'll do this again. Um, <laughs> take two. No, um, but again, it has truly been a pleasure and an honor to have you guys. Um, again, just all the trailblazing, the history making, everything that you're absolutely doing. We are so proud of you. And you have fans all the way in the Virgin Islands, in Texas, all over this United States, all over this world. Uh, anytime you guys want to connect, me and this goofball over here do a uh, show on Instagram live called The Bridge. And that's what we're trying to do is connect. We're connecting respiratory therapists to nurses. We're connecting um, students to practitioner. Maybe that complacent practitioner to then find some fire again. Um, we had some people from India, Ireland, Canada. We've had people from all over the world just kind of join and chat with us. And all we're doing is, in, is having more conversations like this. So anytime you guys would like to join us, you are more than welcome and we would open you with, we would welcome you with open arms, so. We would love to. And thank you guys for giving us this opportunity to come and talk to you and get the word out there on this platform. So thank you guys so much as well. You guys are great. Yeah, you're <laughs> yeah, very thank welcome. you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks you guys. Scott, JJ, appreciate you guys as always. Um, you guys go be great.